Les, thanks so much for coming out. My pleasure. Um, I, hope, I, I hope that you've enjoyed the experience so far with Startup Grind. Um, Startup Grind Prince William County. By the way, if you have not um, followed us on Twitter or Facebook, I think, and, yeah, twice, Facebook and Twitter, um, I'd love it if tonight, if you have one of those accounts that you followed us, uh, that you would just share something about your experience along the way. I think that would be a great way to start telling the story of who we're bringing in as our guests. So Les came to us tonight from Annapolis. Thank you so much for coming out, Les. Um, tell us a little bit about who Les is and where, where, you, where you come from, maybe some of your formal educational background and business experience before that first period as being a CEO. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Happy to do it. So first off, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is great. It's my first experience here at Centerfuse. It's a cool environment. I think it's great. I can truthfully say I've never been to one of these and been offered a beer and a taco before speaking engagement. <laughs> and it's the very first time that I've ever actually had a beer before a speaking engagement. So you guys are all subject to a new experiment. <laughs> but it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Les Trackman. I, I've been doing this thing called business for a lot of years. And um, actually I know that the speaker you had uh, in the first session uh, called himself a reformed lawyer. <laughs> and um, I actually have a legal education as well, but I was even smarter than him. I actually never practiced law. <laughs> so I didn't have to get reformed from that. But I've been reformed from a few other things along the way. Um, so start out with my early background. So, so one thing that was really important to me growing up was my mom was a kindergarten teacher. She was a kindergarten teacher for something like 40 years. And she's actually, I'm gonna go visit her on Saturday. She's now 94 years old. Uh, she lives not far from actually where I grew up in New York. And um, what, uh, what my mom always taught me was that a uh, couple things. One is any idiot can spell. And I wrote that actually in my book. Um, and cause I was that idiot that couldn't spell and then came spell checkers. So now any idiot can spell, and she's right. Uh, that was one. The second one was she always told me that all I needed to do to be successful was do my best. And although when I was a young child, I used to sort of, you know, uh, take that for granted and say, yeah, 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 sure, that's a mom speaking or a kindergarten teacher speaking or something like that. But there's really some great wisdom in there about do your best. Doesn't mean you have to succeed every time. It just means that when you do something, you gotta do it with the utmost of what you've got. And that's really all you can ask. And I think that message is something that's resounded with me for my entire career. And I probably have shaped my career entirely. So now here's some of the gory details. Uh, so I grew up always thinking that I wanted to run something when I got a little bit older. So I thought about being a CEO. And um, as I was going through my educational process, I would ask people, so what kind of background should I have to be a CEO? And um, a couple people said to me that you, you really need a technical background. To understand in today's world, <clears throat> you need to have some fundamental understanding of technology so that when you build stuff, you'll kind of know what it is. So I decided that was pretty good. I was kind of a STEM kid from the early stages. I was pretty good at physics. And so I decided to study engineering in college. And so I, I enrolled in a, in a little college in upstate New York called Union College. Uh, the thing you should know about Union College, in case you never heard of Union College, is that a school of 2,100 students won the national championship in hockey three years, uh, four years ago now. So that's our claim to fame. The national championship. <laughs> We'd be BU, BC, um, <laughs> Minnesota, a bunch of big schools. So, so it's like the little engine that could. But in any case, I went to Union College, great, great school to go to, small school, very comfortable for me. Um, learned engineering, did pretty well in engineering and thought that when I got done with school, I would go out and you know, take the world on and uh, turn it on fire. And um, as I was getting ready to graduate, so as I turned into my senior year, I woke up one day and I said, hmm, I wonder what an engineer actually does. <laughs> now, that may sound stupid, but you might want to talk to your kids if they're in college or in high school these days because none of us really know what it means to be out in the, in the workforce, at least yeah. not before we've been there. And that's why actually Dan and I talked a little bit about 
interns um, and things like that. So do yourself a favor and, and give kids an opportunity to intern, whether they're in high school or whether they're in college or someplace. Give them some internship opportunities because they really need to know what it's like. And but for the fact that I had a fraternity brother at that time whose dad was an engineer, an electrical engineer. I went to school in, in New York at that time. Well, I won't give you the exact years, but at that time we hadn't yet landed on the moon. And well, at least while I was in high school. And um, there was this really neat engineering company on Long Island called Grumman, right? Now part of another bigger company. And his dad worked for Grumman as an engineer, electrical engineer. So I said, his name is Jed. Actually, I'm having dinner with him on Friday, it turns out. And uh, I said, hey, Jed, uh, do you think your dad would like to um, uh, have me shadow him in the office one day because I'd really like to know what an engineer does. And he said, sure. And actually, I'm still friends with his dad today. And um, he calls me actually for advice, which is really just a good feeling because he <laughs> gave me great advice. And I actually went to, I went to, to, I spent a day with him in the office at Grumman. And he was in a room with uh, no offices and a metal desk and a pencil holder on his desk. And he was really smart and he did really important work and he ultimately put a man on, helped to put a man on the moon. And I hated it. It was abominable for me. I said, well, how do you decide what you're doing today? And he said, well, they tell me. And I said, and, and you know, what kind of flexibility do you have? How much thought process do you have and new ideas and all that? And he said, well, we have a job to do and we have a task to do and we're aiming at that and that's what we do. Now, that may be a little bit of overstated and it may have been my perception as a college student, you know, free and footloose at that time. But I got the impression that this was going to be a regimented environment for me. So I said, okay, that's great. Now, I had decided that all I needed was an undergraduate degree and I was raring to get out in the marketplace. So my dad, who was kind of, my dad was a, was a worker all his life. So he, we, I didn't grow up in a family with a lot of money. He worked very hard, did fine for himself and saved every penny that he had but he paid for my college education. That and the scholarship helped pay for my college education. So I said to him, actually he said to me, you should go on to graduate school. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna get this engineering degree. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna change the world and I'm never going to graduate school because I'm done with this school thing. After my day with my friend's dad, I came back and said, I'm going to graduate school. Well, unfortunately, I had made this, <clears throat> this, this um, deal with my dad that if I ever went to graduate school, I'd pay for it myself. So I did. <laughs> Fortunately, you said. <laughs> yes. I did. I, I paid for myself. I actually made the same deal with my kids, and so far they haven't gone to graduate school. Uh, so maybe this is backfiring. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. But anyway, um, I decided that I wanted, I still had this dream to be this CEO to run my own company, and so I did some more research and said, okay, so I'm an engineer now, and I want to run my own company, but I think I need to go to graduate school first. What should I study? And so a lot of people gave me advice that I should go get my MBA. And I said, everybody gets their MBA. How could that distinguish you in your career? And I found this thing. This is now, I will give you the year, right? 1977. Um, and uh, at that time, there was this new program that was coming out in a couple of different um, universities. And it was called a JD MBA. Now, it may sound familiar today, but there was no such thing back then. And I ended up going to a school called uh, Emory University in Atlanta. So I, I found God and came south of the Mason-Dixon line. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I went to Emory and did a four-year program and got a JD and MBA. And when I got done, I said, okay, now I've made it. I've got everything I need. I've got an engineering degree. I've got a business degree. And I've got a law degree. And I went out looking for a job. This was during my senior year. went out looking for a job. And employers would look at me and say, well, which one do you want to do? You want to be an engineer? Or do you want to be a lawyer? Or do you want to be in business? <clears throat> so it was a bit, sorry, I have this. It's just, that's all good. It's what happens when you drink a beer before you speak. <laughs> <laughs> it was a test case. It's a test case. We're going to take this one. Mark that down. We'll never do that again. Um, in any case, um, so uh, they couldn't understand what I did, and I called it three degrees below zero. I didn't know what I was going to do. And thank God for the fact that there was a student in my class a year ahead of me that we shared an entrepreneurship class, and he graduated a year before I did, formed a company, and when I graduated, he asked me to join him. 
and it was a software company doing software for personal computers before there was an IBM personal computer. Really cool. And I didn't know what that was, and I asked him to tell me, and he showed me an article written by a guy named Stuart Alsop, who you may know today. And Stuart wrote this great article about a company called VisiCalc that had just come out with this really neat spreadsheet, which for those of you who are not old enough to know that, that was a predecessor before Excel. In fact, that was it. Lights out. Uh, VisiCalc was it. In fact, it was the reason people bought, at that time, mostly Apple computers. But that's what happened. So I fell into really lucky, with all that planning for the engineering and the law and the business, I fell into a job in entrepreneurship uh, in, a comp in a small company, and that was it. I found my love. And from that day on, I never looked back and said, wow, was I lucky, and I'm an entrepreneur. And that's what I do today. I still am an entrepreneur. I'll fast forward a little bit to the point where I became a CEO. So I worked in, in a lot of entrepreneur entrepreneurial companies, went through a couple of mergers with some really cool companies that I worked at, uh, worked at some duddy companies along the way, and one day had a, um, a lunch, it was a fortuitous lunch with a venture capitalist up in Boston, and he turned to me and he said, I was probably about, eh, probably pretty close to 40, and he turned to me and he said, hey Les, I've heard your story, he knew a friend of mine, he said, you always wanted to be a CEO, why aren't you one? And it was a great question because I didn't have an answer. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I said, well, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready yet. I'm still learning things. He said, that's not a good excuse. If you want to be a CEO, it's time. And so I actually began to look for jobs that were looking for a CEO. And I was surprised to hear that people actually were interested in me. So I did take on my first uh, CEO job. It was... Um, I was probably a little too eager. I probably didn't do enough due diligence. That's part of the case study that Harvard wrote about me, <laughs> the part where they laughed at me. Uh, I, did some, I did some things that probably weren't great for, my, for that part of my career. And my very first job as a CEO lasted nine months, and I got fired. Fired. Abruptly fired. Not just abruptly fired. I walked out in the hallway one day, and there was nobody in their offices. I'm going, wow, that's so weird. I'm the CEO of this company. Did they call a meeting without me? What happened? And it turned out that the chairman who had hired me had asked everybody to leave the office and sent the company attorney down to fire me. Mm -hmm. And so, ding, 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 my phone rings, and it's the company attorney. And he says, hey, I was thinking about coming by and seeing you. Would that be OK? And I said, sure, <laughs> is this going to be good news? <laughs> anyway, I got fired. So interestingly enough, worked my whole life to become a CEO. Nine months later, got fired. OK, there's one more piece of the story that I want to give you. And then at some point, we'll talk about some good things that happened as well. One more piece of the story was I had given up a job as a vice president of a publicly traded software company in Boston to take on this first role as a CEO. I had moved my family to Connecticut. I had bought a house and had a big mortgage on my house, thinking that I would grow into it as my company began to succeed. And I got fired, and in return for getting fired, had two months severance, living in a new place. My, I came home that day in the middle of the day. I'm a pretty much of a workaholic, I still am today. I came home about two o'clock in the afternoon. My wife looks at me and goes, what's going on? And I said, I got fired. She said, really? And I said, yeah, I got fired. She said, oh, okay, so what are we going to do about paying the mortgage? And I said, you know what? I have no idea, but I can't think about it right now. And I went out and got my golf clubs from the garage, and I went out and played golf because I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm not a very good golfer, so that gets my aggressions out. Um, but that was the beginning of my CEO career. From there, it was interesting, and I'll give you the, the, the bridge, and then we can changed the subject a little bit, but the bridge was one door closes, another one opens. I got fired. I got home from playing golf that day. At that time, we had answering machines. Remember that before voicemail? <laughs> I got home, and there was a bunch of calls on my answering machine, and I didn't know why my wife hadn't picked up, but there were calls on the answering machine, and I started answering them, and it was 
there were six calls from different people who had heard that I got fired and asked me if I could come help them in their company. Wow. Including one that asked me to be CEO of another company that they were on the board of. And at that point, I actually said, I'm not ready to. I need to think this one over. Didn't know if I'd ever be a CEO again. And ultimately took a consulting job first and then took on that job as CEO. And it was glorious with lots of lessons that I learned from my first one. So there you go. Sorry, that was long-winded. But that's the, that's the true and honest story. I did get fired one more time in my career. We can talk about that later, too. So I, I, th I think just starting with the kids, um, we can call that a wrap. And, uh, <laughs> because I absolutely concur. There's some great points that you've brought up. Um, and a very intriguing story. I don't remember reading about all of that. Uh, it's not in the book. Okay. It's in the case, though. It's in the, ca in the, the Harvard case. case. So I got to go to business school somewhere. <laughs> Uh, and and that's not really on the top of my list either. So, well, I, 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 thank you for sharing all of that. I don't, you know, we've only got an hour, and I know that there is a ton of good content in your book. So let's start there. Okay. Um, let's fast forward a little bit, and if you need to backtrack to talk about some of those experiences along the way, please feel free to fill in the blanks. Sure. But so let's start with the title of your book, because admittedly for me, and I've shared it with a few people here, don't f it up is the title of the book, right? Um, explicitly, but blanked out. So it confused me. When I saw the title and I, I heard the title and Les and I spoke on the phone, even after we spoke and I was impressed with what we talked about, the title of the book confused me. But once I opened the cover, I was, I was okay, now everything makes sense. So can we start there? Sure. So Don't F It Up was actually something that was said to me, and it was said to me in my fifth time of being a CEO, and all of my CEO engagements, including the one that I got fired from first, were taking over from the founder. Happens quite a bit, by the way, if you're looking for an opportunity to become a CEO, find yourself some techie somewhere that realizes that they, or thinks that they don't know what they need to know to run a company, or don't know how to raise capital, or something like that, and then open, that opens the door for you, and you might be able to come in and help help that entrepreneur, help the company, etc. So I've done that six times in my career. I like to say I'm probably the only living human being, because some of us have passed away along the way of doing this, but I'm the only living human being who's done that six times, I think, in their life. Either because I'm resilient or because I'm stupid, I'm not sure which, but, but I've done it. In any case, in the fifth time that I did it, I took over for a friend of mine. In fact, that's how I got down to Maryland. My friend, who I had known for about a dozen years, um, was running a company, you, you guys actually, somebody here knows about it, a company called Force 3. Uh, his name is Rocky Cintron. He's still a good friend of mine today and actually an investor in my company today. And Rocky uh, called me in Connecticut where I was living at the time and he said, Les, I need some help running this company. Would you like to come down and help me? And I said, no. I live in Connecticut. My son is about to finish high school. I'm not going to relocate. He said, no, I'm not asking you to relocate. Just come down when you need to. You can do the rest from Connecticut. So I began that process, and about three months into it, he made me the, the offer I couldn't refuse to come do it full time, take over for his role, and he would, he would turn into the chairman, and I would take over as CEO. So we agreed to that, and the day he was literally handing me the keys to the office, he said to me, I just have one piece of advice for you. And I said, what's that? And he said, don't F it up. And although that sounds like a a, a phrase that's a throwaway phrase, I took that to heart and I said, okay, what does that mean? Now, a lot of my career is based upon saying, what does that mean? You'll find that out if you know more about me. I don't take a lot of things for granted. And a lot of times when you say something, you might mean something different than what I'm hearing because we as human beings don't do a good job of matching um, either emotions or states of mind. So I said, okay, Rock, I think I get it. I said, but let me tell you something. Please don't ever say that to anyone else. You and I know each other pretty well, and I get it. But I think that's an inhibiting statement because what it means is don't do anything that's going to put us at risk. Now, I just became the CEO of this company. What's my job? My job every day is to put the company at risk. Otherwise, we're not changing or we're not growing. So interestingly enough, Rocky meant it in the most heartfelt way possible. We had a very successful company, $350 million in revenue. He's handing me the keys. He knows it needs help, but he's saying to me, 
look, I put my life into this company and I'm giving you my baby, you're adopting it and I don't want you to mess it up. I really don't want you to do that. And I got it. I got it immediately. But I also realized that that was a straitjacket that I was going to have to wear as the CEO of that company. So I had to play that out with Rocky. And we did play it out over the years. It just so happened, one, I had done this four other times before, and I kind of knew the drill. And, and two, I knew Rocky really well, so I could level with him and say, OK, so here's what I'm about to do. And it's going to put some risk on there, but it's not necessarily going to hurt the company. So that's where that phrase came from. Rocky loves it. He loves to come to book signings and things like that. <laughs> he says, I'm the guy who said that. <laughs> Well, and I think it's super important because from a, and, and I saw a lot of, I came from a military background, um, and I saw a lot of military style leadership throughout your learning experience in your book, but then I also saw a lot of positive and human psychology, performance psychology based material that I was seeing. I think there was even some references to some of the same people I've followed or studied. Um, but that's important for any of your teams. If you have people working with you, I think being clear in what you're communicating to them, how you're communicating with them about what it is you're asking them to do. Because you absolutely, it can be taken as, oh, well, if I mess this up, then that's really going to be bad for me. Yeah. And it is very binding. Well, it's, it's interesting. I didn't say that about the first CEO gig that I took on, but that's exactly what I violated. Right? I took risks that the founder and the owners were not comfortable with, and we never had that dialogue in advance. So for those of you who are either founders or may become successors or are successors today, realize that that relationship between you and whomever the successor is, or even you and another executive, that's a relationship that you need to figure out what that really means and where your leash will let you get to, if you will, to use the leash analogy. You need to understand that. And one of the things that I learned along the way is, you need to be explicit about that, explicit to the, fact, to the point where you actually write it down, and then after you write it down, you actually read it back, maybe a few times along the way, and maybe set up times where you test it, where you test the, okay, so what you said is we could do this, but is that really what you mean and what you feel today? So although I use the marriage analogy a lot mm -hmm. in business, the, the relationship between a founder and the person who takes over for the founder is as close to a marriage relationship as you can get. There is a contract, sometimes literally a contract, and it is one where there's a lot of trust, but there's a lot of opportunities to violate that trust. And you need to understand what that means, and you need to be really sensitive to that in every situation. It's interesting, I say the same thing about CEOs and their boards. So for those of you who are CEOs and have outside boards, a lot of times there's this sort of, I'll call it wishy-washy relationship between the CEO and the board. The board says, yes, we have goals and this is what they'll be. And the CEO says, yes, I understand it and thank you for giving me this incentive plan. I'll meet those goals. That's interesting. But is that what everybody means? So when you have the opportunity to do that thing that's going to reach your goal and it's not in the interest of the company, what do you do as a CEO? Do you go back to the contract and say, okay, wh what does this mean? Or do you rely on the trust? Or what do you do? So you have to be really careful with that. And I always suggest that not just an employment contract, because that's interesting, and that is something you put in the closet and hopefully never look at again. But you should have a, 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 a pact with your board that says, here's what you can expect from me from a communication point of view. Here's what you can expect from me from a metrics point of view. Here's what you can expect from me from a board meeting point of view. Here's what you can expect from me from a frequency of communication point of view. Nothing wrong with doing that. It takes a little bit of time, it takes a little bit of effort, something that most people don't like to do in advance because it feels like you're saying, well, you don't trust me. And I got news for you, it has nothing to do with trust. Ultimately, it comes down to in business, at least in a for-profit enterprise, maybe even in a not-for-profit enterprise, ultimately it's performance that matters. And so having that really clear understanding about what's required is something that I highly, highly, highly encourage people to do, both the founder successor relationship and the, the CEO board relationship, and maybe even your executives as well. I think that's a great transition point, Les. But before we go on and move into the transition, because I think that leads in really to the first chapter of your book, 
So the book is written, if I understood it correctly, really in like phased, in a phased approach from the infancy of that successor founder relationship through the re release of the company from the founder to the successor. Is that? Yeah, it's, okay. a, it's, it's a, it's potentially it's a cookbook for the life of a founder and, and successor relationship. Perfect. Before we go on to that, um, what, what would you say just, I, I might be putting you on the spot, but what, what would be some of the key metrics that you as a CEO would be telling the board you would be communicating with them on a consistent basis? So uh, metrics is a hot topic. Yeah. So, so it, I mean, it depends on what your company is, but, but first off, I would get the frequency of, of board communication. So whether that's, I'm only going to speak to you when it's a board meeting, mm -hmm. that's important. Or what I recommend to the CEOs that I work with, and I, I sit on the board of a company, I recommend it to the CEO of that company, is what do you want from me as a board member? Right? One, of the, one of the missing ingredients in most boards, almost every public company board is missing this, which is what's my job as a board member? I don't mean is my job to show up at board meetings. Of course that's your job. But what else do you need from me? What have you hired me to do? And I want to know that as a board member. Do you want me to find you new clients? Do you want me to introduce you to people that I know? Do you want me to get you mentorship relationships? What do you want from me? And board members should have jobs. There's two reasons board members should have jobs. One is if they're good board members, they want to help. And probably they have some vested interest in the company. But the other reason that's more important to the CEO is, I always say, give your board member something to chew on so he doesn't chew on your leg. <laughs> I had a great board member, actually, we went and just celebrated his, uh, his career just a couple of weeks ago up in New York, and um, he was the one who said to me, uh, he said a couple of things to me that were very important, one of which was, um, if you want a friend, get a dog. I am not your friend as a board member. <laughs> now, I just went up 20 years later and celebrated his, his life and his career, and I believe we are friends, but that's not the relationship between a board member and a CEO. It's really not a friend relationship. So what you really want to know is what's the expectations. The expectations could be, should be metrics, could be, should be what's in the board book. So some of my boards, and I highly encourage this on boards, um, reprint the budget or the plan for the year in every board book. So we always know what we're, what we're using as a metric. There's a new thing that's going around now. Certainly some of you have heard about it. OKRs, John Doerr's OKRs. Have you, have you heard about that, OKRs? Objective and key results. So John Doerr just wrote a book uh, called Measure What Matters. Very relevant to your question. Um, it's really good. In fact, I'm going to present it to a bunch of CEOs on Monday um, because I think it's a very succinct way to say, here's some expectations that we set, and here's how we're doing against those expectations. And it's objective. It's not subjective. Right. And it's you get clearly called out for it, and you either make it or you don't. There's no kind of sorta. And the kind of sort of is the thing that gets you in trouble. And it, and it, just to clarify really quickly, because I just had a conversation with someone else about that. It's, it's identifying the objective, whatever it is, and then identifying the metrics that associate with the, achieving that objective. Is that the they, key? The key metrics. That the key. The key. Yeah. Re, yeah the key results, is, as John Doerr calls them, are really, really important. So it's, it's the we will, you know, create the greatest new social media product in the world, as measured by. Boom, boom, boom. So it's not the did we do it or not, it's did we meet these results. Yes. And that becomes, again, one of those objective things. And when you share that at the board level, share that with the executives, then you got much better understanding of what are we doing. Just, just a quick aside on that one. We talked a little bit about um, CEOs who listen versus CEOs who don't listen. A lot of CEOs, I'm probably one of them, like to hear themselves speak. They often don't like to hear other people speak. And that's a disease that you get when you become a CEO. It's, it's one you have to get over, but it's, but, and there's not a great inoculation shot for it, but it's one you have to get over. And that's a problem that you have. So if you're a CEO, you've got to be willing to listen. And you've got to be willing to accept that maybe there's some ideas out there that are different than, this, than the crazy ideas you have that got you to where you are today, because um, those will help you to fail going forward. So we got to get through all of that stuff as, as CEOs. And it, there should be like a rehab school for CEOs. <laughs> I won't go there. Uh, 
uh, they probably shared literally. with the actors. <laughs> Um, it's so, okay. I think that's a great lead in. Like I talked about a minute ago, I think you just followed up with that to talk about how, so a founder recognizes at some point that they need, to, they're at a stage of growth where they need to do something different and they're not sure what they're doing. And you know, in the first chapter of your book, you start talking about empowering others. Yep. Let's walk through what that looks like. How does a founder know when it's time to start searching for a CEO and what's that, what's that look like? Yeah, so, um, so I, I say anecdotally that founders have a difficult time knowing when it's time to give up, when it's time to find somebody else to do the job. Because as, as founders and CEOs in general, you know, we're always heads down trying to get to that next goal and we don't think about what's going on around us. But I use one really important, I'll call it a metric because we're talking about metrics today, to help CEOs know when they should think about getting somebody else in. And that's when the people that work for them in the company tell them how smart they are. Now, it may sound like a joke, but there's this thing called the emperor has no clothes, right? Y'all read it as mm -hmm. a kid. Hans Christian Andersen, right? He wrote that. And it's really true. When, as a CEO, as a founder especially, it's really hard to start a company. Going from zero to one, as your speaker said <laughs> last time, is a really, really hard job. Going zero to two is pretty hard too, by the way. The it's second tough. one, it's tough. The second one is always the harder one, I I think. But in any case, getting a company started is a is truly a, a magical act. And you all know the statistics, or know some of the statistics. You know, the, the a company being in business for five years is like a like a hen's tooth. It just doesn't. You can't find many of them around. Um, so somebody who does that has done something magical. To do that, you've got to have a loyal band of people that work with you go in the foxhole with you to use, a, to use a military analogy, who you can trust with your life and your company, your baby, if you will. Um, so it's very natural for the people in the CEO's exec, on the CEO's executive team to be very loyal to her. Very, very, very common. The problem is when that loyalty starts to fog the lens of reality and they start to say, ah, don't worry about it, it's great. You're doing a great job or yeah we just lost that account but that client's stupid and you'll start to hear those things where people are starting to tell you how smart you are and you're looking around going wow i didn't know i was smart um and that's the beginning of the emperor has no clothes you need to think about the okay what do i need to do here and do i need to perhaps even change out some of the executives on my team and that's one of the things that founders are very 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 bad at right so we just talked about Founders' teams are very loyal. They are. And it's important that they're loyal. So, by almost by definition, founders have a very difficult time changing out, I'll use the fired word, even with an HR person here in the audience. Uh, very hard for a founder to ever fire somebody that's an executive on their team who they were in the foxholes with, the trenches with, and did that early battle and had that, uh, that initial success. Very, very hard. Oftentimes, that's the time to hire a successor or begin to find a successor because I can tell you, in at least two of my situations, I became CEO purposefully because the founder could not fire an important executive who was just not towing their, their weight. Mm -hmm. Now, quick aside, just so that I can, I can get off the HR uh, bad list or blacklist, um, the, just because the executive needs to be fired or, as we like to say, made available to industry, <laughs> just because that happens doesn't mean that executive is bad at all companies change I use the analogy in my book of a snake shedding its skin in order for a snake to grow it must shed its skin in order for a company an executive team to grow sometimes it must shed some executives they were great at what they did at that time it's a different task now we need to put somebody else in place be really nice to those people make sure they had lots of stock options pay them royally that same venture capitalist board member of mine who we celebrated the other night, he gave me the, another lesson in life, and he said, be nicer on the way out than you ever were on the way in. And that's a word of wisdom that you should take with you forever. Even if it's a marriage, by the way, you should take that with you forever. Mm. Not hey, that that's, I get marriage That's good advice. But, but be nicer on the way out because that's what you'll be remembered for, not the way in. And you know what? That person got you the success that you got. Make sure that they benefit from that. So... Man, that's great. I think, I think um, well, we've covered a lot of ground uh, and from what I've read in the book and, and 
That's very practical advice. And so um, it sounds to me like, and I think you mentioned this in the book as well, there's, there's those family relationships that are incorporated sometimes in those executives. And, yes. and so that you have to combat that as well. And, and would you? So I've taken over as CEO from a husband and wife team, the son of the chairman, two brothers, probably some other familial relationships as well. So it's not uncommon in an early stage company to have family working in the company. If you want to find loyal employees who don't have to get paid very much, you know, just look around the dinner table and you'll find them. And so you do. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. Again, you need those loyal employees and they probably come a little bit cheaper than they would if they were in the open marketplace. However, that makes it really difficult, one, to fire, because as I've said about my kids over and over again to my wife, you can't fire your kids. <laughs> Although we've had situations nice. where I've wanted to. <laughs> makes managing kids harder than managing a company, as I said, during Thanksgiving. Um, but, it, <laughs> but in addition, um, you also will stunt your executive team by having a family member on the executive team. You will. You can deny it. You can tell me I'm wrong. And I've been wrong before, so that's okay. I'll be wrong again. But if you have a, a family member on your executive team, it will be perceived, whether it's true or not, that that person is favored no matter what they do objectively. And so you'll be subject to that. If it's a husband and wife team, there's always going to be pillow talk. That goes well beyond what goes on in the office. When I took over as the CEO of a husband and wife team, you know, the husband would come in and say one thing to me. The wife would come in and say the other thing to me. They would tell me about their marriage problems. And I'm sitting here going, please, what do you talk about me when you're, you know, when you're in bed <laughs> together? If you're telling me about each oh, other, this no, is crazy. No, no, no. <laughs> it's really hard. So I, I, I really, truly always implore entrepreneurs, if you're really trying to grow a company, not a lifestyle company, but if you're trying to grow a company that you're going to get outside investment in, jettison the family as early as you can. Be nicer to them on the way out than you are on the way in. Uh, I had to do that with a, with a, a brother that, um, that I had to fire for, from a founder. And, um, and it's, I'm a, so most of you don't know me from a management point of view, but I'm really thrifty. How's that? I was going to say cheap, but I said thrifty. <laughs> I'm really thrifty. I hate to spend money that I don't need to spend because I'm an entrepreneur. I want things to happen with very little resource if I possibly can make it happen. Had this brother that was the CFO. The brother had no business being the CFO. The company was growing. He was keeping checks in his drawer, didn't know what to do with them, didn't have any clue really what was going on. Quick anecdote on that. He called me into his office one day. I was the CEO, right? Took over from his brother. He called me to his office one day because I wasn't wearing socks. And that was a violation of the employee man. Okay. So this guy was wrong. He was wrong. Not that I, I wasn't wearing socks. He wasn't wrong about that. <laughs> But he just wasn't, he didn't have the right demeanor to do that. We were a growing entrepreneurial tech company. And I mean, we were lucky that people wore pants in the office. So, <laughs> so, so socks were, you know, having those was okay. In any case, I had to fire him. And my board came to me, same board that said, be nice on the way out. And they said, okay, this is what you're going to need to do for him. And I said, are you kidding me? I have to pay him that much money and a car too? And they said, how much is it worth to you? to get rid of him. I said, okay, I'll pay him. Now, now, so correct me here. Is that the same story that I also read about that the loyalty component kind of bit you on that one? Um, not actually on that one. Okay. That was a different one. But there's, there's family. I probably could look at almost every company that I've done this with, and there was family lurking somewhere, mm -hmm. somewhere in the board, uh, executives, or marriage. So, yeah, it's... It's really hard, but there is that, that, that loyalty thing. Look, people are loyal. I mean, we talk about blood's thicker than water. People are loyal to their family. I get it. I am as well. But I actually have a rule in my household, which is no family member of mine will ever work in my company. Actually, I've said to both my kids, I would be happy to work for you, but you will never work for me. <laughs> and it's really true. They never will work for me. They're way smarter than working for me. So I think that opens up to, to you, you kind of talked about the socks situation. It made me jump right to another, By the way, another section. These socks, I'll have to show you, these socks are for my daughter. 
she she supplies all my socks. Oh, that reminds me. Yeah. So, oh, yes. I was waiting for that. Yeah. I, I have to back up. I apologize. But um, Nestle Crunch Bars. Do you like Nestle I Crunch Bars? I love Nestle Crunch okay, Bars. Okay, good. Thank so you. happy you asked that that's, question. That's on video for you. Um, okay. So thank you. So uh, the, the ability to give and receive candid feedback. What, what, what's the importance of that? So, and, and I kind of skipped around a little bit. I know you have um, this, this leadership values ladder. Um, I'm not, I don't remember where in the rungs that falls, but if you can guide us along that really quickly. So candid feedback is something that we, it's not just a founder thing, although founders are pretty bad at it. Um, it's something that we as executives and CEOs don't do very well. So we don't really solicit nor accept negative feedback from anybody. We do talk about, you know, in HR, in HR parlance, we say feedback is a gift. Please tell us what you think. And that's great. But we really don't <laughs> care. We really don't care. It's terrible, but we don't care. We have to learn to care. Because what happens is this, is we as CEOs are, we get, we get elevated by definition as a company grows, we get elevated into a position where our feet are no longer touching the ground in a, in a lot of analogous ways but mostly in the way of we don't really get to talk to customers that much, right? When customers call and they're angry, they talk to somebody in customer support. When customer calls and they're happy, they talk to salespeople. We don't get to talk to sales, we don't get to talk to, to customers, so we don't really know what's going on. We only hear what's going on. And with that, the market is always changing. Maybe more so today than it ever has, although it's changed abruptly in my lifetime a lot. But there are lots of companies out there name brand, very well-established brands that you know of that went away because the CEO and executive team was absolutely tone deaf to listening to what was going on. And I write about them a little bit in my book, but, it, but, they're, but it's almost trite these days. So Kodak, everybody knows Kodak, the big fail, right? Did you know Kodak invented the digital camera? Yes. Did you know people in Kodak went to the CEO and said, we got this really cool thing, it's a digital camera, we think it's gonna take over the world. And the CEO said, it'll never be better than film. <laughs> blockbuster video. Remember Blockbuster Video? Yes. Probably most of you are old enough at least to have known there was a thing called Blockbuster Video. It was a video store. They sold VHS tapes and then DVDs. Blockbuster Video run by a really <laughs> smart guy, a really smart guy that knew retail backwards, yeah. forwards, and inside out grew Blockbuster Video. I mean, there was a lot of mom and pop tape stores around and these guys grew and they became a public company worth a lot of money. And a little company called Netflix came calling on them and said, hey, you know what? We're a fledgling company. We think we got something that really is valuable and we'd prefer to let you take it forward and we'll come join your company, but it's different than what you got. And literally, literally, Netflix, Net, sorry, the, the blockbuster executive team laughed them out of the room. Blockbuster, you know how much it's worth today? Zero. You know how much Netflix is worth today? I didn't check the stock market, but last time I looked, $170 billion. Who's laughing now? Yeah. Why did that happen? They were offered, they were literally offered that company. And they said, it's a joke. We're not going to do that. Nobody wants this stuff. Mail CDs to me. Remember, it was mailing CDs yeah. back in the Netflix early days. Mailing CDs to me. Uh, we're not going to do it. So tone deaf is what happens. It happens honestly to CEOs because we don't have our feet attached to the ground anymore. We don't really know what's going on. And we have to be willing to listen and or empower our team to tell us that the emperor has no clothes when the emperor has no clothes. Hard thing to listen to. Hard thing to digest. Certainly a hard thing to react to, but it's really necessary. And if we don't do that, we fail. Mm. And we will fail. And it will continue to happen. And it's, those are just two stories. And there's lots of them out there. <laughs> well, and that feeds right into the, the I'm, a, I'm familiar with the term, and Lee Lefevre wrote a book about the terms, uh, but the curse of knowledge, I think, fits right into that picture. It um, is. You want to talk a little bit about what that looks like and, sure. and how, how you might suggest people do their best to combat it? Yeah, so the curse of knowledge, I didn't make it up. I just read about it. It's really, really important. I read about it in uh, The Brothers Heath, as I like to call it, Made to Stick. You know that book, Made to Stick? It's a really, really important book on communication in general, business specifically, and you can throw sales in there as well. 
but um, they have this term called the, the, the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge is, it's a human condition. So we as humans start to see things based upon the lenses that we've built for ourselves. So if we think we are a successful retail company and we're Blockbuster, everything to us looks like successful retail. That's what we're looking at. Just so happens that what they were confronted with was something that was an opportunity that had nothing to do with retail. It was more of a delivery service. So we create these lenses, it's called knowledge, and we then are susceptible to actually being cursed by that because we can't figure out stuff that doesn't look like what we think it looks like. Now that is a human condition and I've studied, I'm not quite a brain scientist, but I've studied brains and brain function a lot because in computers, AI and things like that are, mm -hmm. are, are mimicking that these days. But the fact is we as human beings, we actually don't have a, a, a unique thought in our brains. What we do is we pattern match. Sometimes we pattern match from other things that we've seen and we can accumulate those together, but we pattern match. So if we've never seen it before, but it looks like a retail environment, we <laughs> perceive it as a retail environment. And so we can't see past that. Steve Jobs has famously talked about connecting dots and he was good at that. So he was looking at things that were way outside of his realm of expertise. And he was going, wow, those look like this and together they seem like this. That's when you get past the curse of knowledge. When you do take your domain outside of the four walls of your office. And I joke about that a lot. I didn't put it in the book, but I joke about it a lot. And I say to people in my office, when I sit in my office, I'm made to believe that I'm smart. And when I get out of the office, I gain knowledge. Mm. So get out of your offices, go find out what other people are doing in other walks of life, in other disciplines, in other everything, and go see if there's something there that's intriguing because it might apply to your business. That's great, and you've set me up once again, so thank you. Uh, we didn't plan this, did we? <laughs> this is working out wonderfully. So um, in, in that transition experience that you talked about, uh, it, you, you mentioned a component of, um, ah, man, it just escaped me, asking great questions. So you weren't always the right CEO for the position when you, when you looked at it from your perspective. Yeah. You want to talk about that and, and why ask, being able to ask good questions is important as it pertains to that? Yeah. So it, it's, it's back to this, what are you hearing when you, when you communicate with somebody or some things or even experience? A lot of times, um, and there was a, there's a great book written by, I think it was Simon Sinek who's, who wrote uh, Start With Why. So we talk about that often in our company. I talk about it all the time when I talk to executives and I say, you really need to find out the causal components of what somebody's saying. And they say, well, how am I going to do that? And I just said, just keep asking why. It's like your kids do to you, right? Drives you nuts. <laughs> why? 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 Why is the sky blue? Yes. Uh, because there's oxygen in it that diffracts the light. Why does that happen? And they'll keep asking until you get fed up. But in fact, <laughs> The causal relationship that they tr are trying to find out is what you need to do. You need to find out. So we'll have a, we do it in sales all the time. So life is sales, but in, in, in business, sales is the front door to what we do. And we'll talk to a prospect and the prospect will say, I need one of those in green. And a bad salesperson will say, okay, great. I can get that for you <laughs> in green. And they'll sell it to you. A good salesperson says, why is green important to you? And the reason that you ask the why is because there likely is some valuable kernel underneath that that can help you unlock more value than what the person is offering to you, whether it's a sales situation or a conversation with your spouse or significant other. Find out the why. If you find out the why, then you're not reacting to the what that they've just told you. And you might be able to figure something out that just is deeper than, than what you can imagine. So I had a board member, different board member in this case. His name is Harry. I saw Harry a couple weeks ago. He was a pain in the neck as a board member. <laughs> There's always one member of a board, by the way, you call him the, I can't say that. Well, I can it's say on, it. It's on video. It, you, you, call him, you call him the loudmouth. How's that? You call him the loudmouth on the board. There's always one loudmouth on the board. Harry was that loudmouth. He was really good at it. But what Harry used to do to me as a CEO is Harry would say, okay, Les, how are our results for this quarter? And I'd say, blah, 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 whatever it was, reciting exactly what the facts were. And Harry would say to me something like, 
Oh, hang on a second. I'm not sure I heard what you said. Could you repeat that? And what do you do when that happens? Do you, do you, can you think about what you do when somebody says, could you repeat that? Try to refine it. You, you, you try to refine it, right? So you go and try to find more details, and you start digging yourself big holes yeah. when you do that. And <laughs> Harry was not hard of hearing, but Harry <laughs> never heard what I said. But he got me, it was like truth serum. He got me to give him the underlying whys to everything that I was trying to present to him, which was a what. And my job as a CEO is to, is to display the what, right? It's the metrics, stupid. But he would get underneath my skin and ask me those questions, the why questions, which would cause me to just give him the truth. Now, that's good. Truth is good, and, and having truth serum probably helps, but it's awfully painful when you're the CEO of a company. And when you're in a, any kind of situation where you're having communication, if you can get to that why, if you can understand it, you will have a much better connection. You'll get to that truth serum with that person. And again, even a significant other, uh, you'd be really surprised at what you find out. And it will benefit you forever. Even though it's a little more painful, it takes a little bit more time. It's what I call, what I tell our salespeople, it's slow down to speed up. Slow down, figure it all out. That'll make your sale much easier than if you just you know, go down this path without or just provide the green suit that the guy asked for. That's excellent, excellent content. Um, and we're getting shorter on time, so I did want to jump. Just shut me up whenever uh, you No, want. no, it's fine. I, I, I'm just taking it all in and, and learning, trying to learn as much as I can while we're here together. Um, so let's talk some top tips for a second. So if I'm a founder and I know that I'm, struggling to take that next step I, I mean we already kind of touched on there's there's an ability to or inability to let go immediately we've got there but what if I'm a founder and I'm starting to look and explore to find a team to bring in what yeah. what, what kind of things should I be looking for so there's a bunch of stuff in my head will explode just trying to answer all of that because <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff you can do so one is um, even if you don't believe what I'm telling you, that you should think about a successor because people are telling you that you're smart or debonair or good looking or whatever that is, you should go out and try to find a successor anyway. Even if you don't give that successor the successor title, find somebody who can sit in for you, who you believe might be just good enough to do that job and put them on your staff and then, then go take a vacation. Literally, go take a vacation and, and step on your cell phone as you're walking out the door. So they can't, mm. they can't get to you. What you really need to find out and you really need to experience on your own is, can the company survive without you? I have never met a founder, entrepreneur, who ever believed a company could survive without them. I've also never met a founder, entrepreneur, that when they walked away from the company didn't say, wow, I didn't realize they could do that. Happens all the time because we have these blinders on. So give yourself an opportunity to get away. Find yourself somebody early. And if you're really serious that someday you might need a successor, create a runway. Create a way to have that person prove themselves out. Maybe it's two people that you want to do. Have them prove themselves out. But a long runway is the greatest way to recruit. So I have a problem with recruiting. There's my HR going back on again. I have a problem with recruiting in general. So if I'm going to go out and try to find myself a successor, uh, I already know that resumes lie. Right? Mm. Everybody knows resumes lie, or at least they're embellishments of the truth. I absolutely know that interviews are performances. They're not real life. How good do you interview? That's not, am I right for the job? It's how good do your interview? And then the last one is references, right? A reference is a setup. When was the last time somebody gave <laughs> so, you a reference that was bad? I actually had one once, and that person didn't get hired. References are setups. So, the, the majority of what we do today to hire people is just going to cause you to fail. The only real way that you can ever figure out if it's right for you is try before you buy. It's like dating. It's like living together more than dating. Get to know what the other person, you know, their foibles, what pisses you off, what they can't do well, what they do do well. Those are the things that you need to know. Having a long runway is that ground where you can figure out whether this person might be the right person to do it. That's one. Then two, what I would say is realize nobody will ever do it as well as you do it. And that, I'm, I'm saying that not necessarily because it's true, but you will believe that. You will believe that nobody will ever be able to do it as well as you. So realize that if you can find somebody who can do it just 80% as well as you, hire that person. 
just hire them. Make them a part of your team. Because 80% is pretty darn good, and that'll give you the chance to move up and do those bigger picture things that you need to do anyway as a CEO. Yeah, I'm glad you hit on that. The 80-20 rule was, was profound, in my opinion. So, um, okay, th that's, I, I think probably now is the best time to open it up to group questions. Um, Happy to. And, and I may hit on a couple more there's I'm, I'm struggling because there's just so much more content in this book that I know we're not gonna get a chance to talk about and it's frustrating me so uh, but yeah so let's uh, let's open it up to questions does anybody have any questions for Les? please so going into some of these uh, companies uh, as the outsider Change at your peril. It's really hard. I can tell you in the very first company I went into, I decided I was going to change the culture, among other things that I was going to change in my nine months of tenure before I got fired. <laughs> in the second company I went into, what I did was I assessed the culture. And I tried to understand what was good about the culture and what wasn't so good about the culture. In my fourth, uh, fifth time of doing it, I set up a committee inside the company to help me understand the reality of what was really going on in the culture because I don't think people were telling me the truth. I think people were telling me what I wanted to hear. So I created a committee of people that I thought had their ear to the ground and who I thought I had a trust relationship with. And I said, please tell me all the gory facts. What's really going on? And we tried to then assess and modify the culture that, that goes on. A founder is a, is a bigger than life in most cases, a successful founder is a bigger than life character. And I am far from a bigger than life character. I'm just not. I'm a dweeby business person that just tries to grow companies. And so, so when I come into a, a situation, first of all, the founder has been much nicer to the employees than I ever will be. I'm likely going to have to, to make a few of them available to industry. And I'm likely not going to have the greatest reputation in the company. I take that as a given before I get in. But I also realize that the changes that I make are at my peril. If I make them too quickly, I could, I could catastrophically impact the culture and the company. If I make them too slowly, I could really screw things up as well because I could be accepting bad behavior, which then is teaching other people in the company that that ba bad behavior is something that I value, and that would be wrong as well. So it's a really, really hard task, and culture matters. matters a lot. Um, a couple of venture capitalists lately have been quoted as saying that culture matters more than anything mm -hmm. in organizations, and perhaps it does. I think that's great too. Uh, and well, and, and going back just a second, the, the, what's the most important thing you would say in that relationship between a founder and CEO that people should be aware of or, or try and avoid? Sorry, so, I didn't mean to steal other people's questions. <laughs> so the, the, it, it goes a lot of different ways, but I'll do it from a successor's perspective because that's what I know best. So the first thing that I need my founder to realize is that we are initially going to be on a bicycle built for two and I'm holding the steering wheels that's what I'm doing so I get to decide what direction we're going to and he's in the back well at least one of the cases it was a she in the back and a, on a bicycle built for two on a tandem bicycle that's called the stoker you know what their job is pedal that's what, our, that's what our relationship needs to be. And if we can get that straight from the beginning, and it sounds abrupt, but that's reality. Two people can't be steering at the same time. If two people are steering, we're going to run off the road. And so we have to understand that to start out with. And that's a, that's a powerful analogy for, the, for the, the founder to get. But the second thing that's even more important, and I, I, get, I get beat up for this all the time, but it's really true. And everybody that's been through it from a negative point of view will tell me that it's right. People that have been through it, where, well, anyway, the, the issue is founders who get succeeded by successors, like me or like somebody else, once they've been succeeded, they really need to leave the company. They really need to leave the company. And that's because, not because I don't want them there, not because I don't like them, not because they can't add value, but the rest of the company does not know how to react to a founder as somebody other than the leader calling the shots if they're still there. There's a, there's a recent analogy with Michael Bloomberg who became the, um, became the, the, the uh, 
the governor, sorry, the mayor of New York City, giving him too much credit, the mayor of New York City, he was there for way too many terms, extended his term limits while he was there, came back to the company that he started, Bloomberg, with no intention at all of taking over the company. He had hired this guy named Dr. Off to be the CEO. Dr. Off did great things as the CEO of the company, was a good friend of Bloomberg. The day Bloomberg finished his mayoral term, he came into the company just to say hello. Dr. Off walked up to him and said, I resign. And Bloomberg said, why? He said, because nobody wants to talk to me anymore. They all want to talk to you. And he did. He left the company yeah. that day. Um, it's, that's the way it is. Larger than life. In his case, he's kind of short in stature, but larger than life. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it is. I've never worked in a company where the founder wasn't the beloved person that everybody wanted to, to, to take, take direction from. So it's really hard. So you've got to get the heck out. Completely out. Yes. Wow, it's a big question. Um, I'll try to answer it simply because the, the hard answer is really, really complicated. I think the, the, the best corporate culture that I can imagine is authentic. It's real. It's not something that's made up where the CEO comes in and says, here's our values for the day. And everybody goes, okay, that's what he thinks. It's got to be something that's authentic. And that doesn't mean it comes from the ground up. It means we live it every day. It means if you say integrity and honesty is the most important thing in your company, and your VP of sales who's knocking the cover off the ball lies to you, you have to fire her. You have to do it. That's where authenticity comes in. If you're not willing to do that, then you lose the game of authenticity or you lose the game of integrity at that point. So you really have to be what you think and say you are. And if you can do that, you can be kind of anything. I mean, we, we, um, I, I teach a class over at, at George Mason, and one of the things we talked about was, um, was the structure of corporations, and one of the companies we looked at was Zappos. Mm -hmm. And all of you know Zappos, and it's a, they call it a holacracy, right? Who the hell knows what a holacracy is, but that's what they call it, <laughs> holacracy. And Zappos is actually struggling with their culture right now, but for Zappos, it's authentic. I actually went to, I didn't believe it, I went to Zappos and visited them, and they'll give you a tour if you go there. And if you're wearing a tie, they will cut it off while you're there. Oh. And they post the ties on the front behind the receptionist. But they're real. This is what they do. And, and they, everybody works in a cube. The CEO works in a cube. The CEO works in a cube in an aisle that has uh, trappings of like plant life on the ceiling. And they call it the jungle. And I said, so why do you call it the jungle? And that's because the executives, because sometimes they have high-level meetings, have to wear monkey suits. <laughs> <laughs> so they call it the jungle. But they make fun of themselves. They don't take themselves too seriously. And it's really authentic. It's everywhere in the culture. And that's great. Works for them. Wouldn't work for me. Wouldn't work for a company that, that well, I guess if I came into one, I, I could probably align with that. But it, it's hard for me to establish something like that because it's not part of my DNA. So I think you just have to, I think all kind of cultures can work, but I think you have to be really authentic. And Well, and so just for the video portion, that question was, what does a good corporate company culture look like, right? Thank you. I think that was a great question. And, yeah. and just to add to that, it, the founder of Tom's called himself the chief, chief shoe giver until his, I think his board convinced him otherwise years later. Yeah, I, there's, there's um, I love Tom's for what they do and I hate Tom's for what they do, so we won't get into that. But there's, there, there, are, uh, there are unintended consequences from what Tom's does. It's great that they are giving shoes away and it's awful that they're ruining the whole uh, infrastructure of any of these these uh, vendors that would be making shoes in those mm. areas. So that's fair. It's, it's teach a man to fish rather than give him a fish. And Tom's is giving him fish. I love him to death. My wife wears Tom's, and they it, they have a great underpinning of why they yes. do what they do. Yeah. But that that whole thing has some negative consequences. So from the CEO perspective, that wouldn't be what you would do. I, I wouldn't do that. No. Okay. We can, we can go with that. So what, what other questions do we have? Um, what skills um, would you recommend people who want to be CEOs to kind of um, work the hardest on or to make a priority? So what's the right skills to develop for becoming a CEO if that's your goal? It's a, it's a really good question and I have, I think, a really good answer <laughs> for it. At least it's a practice answer. Kids, when I go to the colleges to speak about the book and, and things about founders and entrepreneurs, ask me that question every time. 
So what skill set do I need to become a CEO someday? And I tell them the same answer all the time is sales. Sales. Mm. You really have to understand sales because a funny thing happens if you can't sell. And that's called nothing. <laughs> and you can't run a company with nothing. So that's what I would say. Get over that one, then you got, then the rest of them can come into place. You know, you need a smattering of other things, but if you can't sell, really hard to be an entrepreneur, hard to be a CEO. Do you want to become a CEO? Want to run my company? Uh, so, when you say sales, what, um, what specifically about selling, like, would you, have, would you have those college kids or other people to kind of um, you know, brush up on? Because a lot of people feel like sales is something that you're either good at or you're not. Yeah, it's not true. So, it's just not true. <laughs> sales is a science. It's an it's a absolute science based upon metrics and Yes, you have to have some interpersonal skills of some sort, but even those you can learn. So I can tell you, I'm not great at public speaking. This is a nice, comfortable group for me, and I had a beer before I started, <laughs> so I'm feeling kind of good about it. But I had to learn how to public speak, and I had to do those things that were really, really painful for me to get myself to be able to do that. It's the same thing with sales. You've got to be willing to put yourself out there. You've got to be willing to get turned down. And then you got to realize that you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. And then it's a metrics game. You got to figure out what your conversion rates are. You got to figure out what the time to, to, to uh, the duration of your sales cycle is. And then you got to do all those little acts like prospect and write um, uh, confirmation letters when you've talked to somebody and things like that to get the job done. And there is nobody that I know of that can't do sales. And there are lots of people who think they are salespeople. And they don't do those things and they're wrong. So really learning the fundamentals and it's truly fundamentals and there are lots of great books out there on the stuff you need to do to sell but it is a, it is a I call it a contact sport. You don't make the contacts, you don't make the sales and you can do that and it's, it's yes everything we do as CEOs today is selling but it's that it's really the how do you get that engagement to, to fill a pipeline so that you can ensure that you can get some revenue so that you can do the rest of the job. One of the things that CEOs in general do poorly is hire sales VPs. So mm. most CEOs don't know what a sales VP looks like, at least most technical CEOs. I shouldn't say no, most CEOs. Most technical CEOs don't, and it happens all the time. They say to me, ah, oh, I got this person, and they got a Rolodex. Remember what a Rolodex was? Yes. <laughs> it's now called a contact management system. They got a Rolodex this big and I'm gonna pay them $400,000 a year and they don't even need a commission and I'm gonna hire this person and I go, are you kidding me? So one, a Rolodex is what you've done in the past. It's not what you're gonna do for me going forward because guess what, all those people have changed jobs already so that ain't gonna help you. Especially if it's still a Rolodex. <laughs> I don't, even I, even I don't have a Rolodex anymore. How long I had one at one point. So, and, and typically what a sales VP, a, a good interview in sales VP will say to a technical founder is don't try this at home, I'm a professional. In fact, don't even ask me questions about it. I will just deliver the results that you need. And there are no metrics. Those metrics, those are for sissies, not for me. I, I'm a professional. And they hire those people and they fail. And it costs them time, which is more important than even the money that they waste on those guys. So we need to think about process and we need to think about people that can execute a process and those are the people that we should be hiring as our sales VPs. And I actually think you can learn it. And, I, and most, especially most people in MBA classes, they think sales is below them. Mm. And that is part of the reason why I say sales because get that done, everything else will follow. We got a question in the back. That's a, before we go, so that's a great question. So Kodak sold a lot of cameras was the presentation here. Where does the vision co part come in for the CEO, right? Because they had no vision going forward. Right? There we go. Yeah. So, so it, it's, a, it's a very fair question, and you can dispute my statement that sales is most important as a skill. I, I'll dispute, I'll, I'll argue with you. 
I'll argue with you a bit, but, but, I, but I don't disagree with you. As a CEO, your role is to see around corners. It is, that's your job, ultimately, is to see around corners. Because the company you build today, the products you build today, the solutions that you sell today will not be the solutions that will make you successful in the future. You're going to have to change everything, as Kodak found out. Um, you're going to have to change everything someday. So you need to have processes in place that will cause that to happen. You actually, I don't think you need to be a visionary, a Steve Jobs-like visionary to be a great CEO. I'm not sure that Cook is a great CEO, by the way, but I don't think you need to be a visionary like, like Jobs to be a great CEO. But I think you need to have processes in place so that you have your antenna out all over the place and you can help to connect some of these dots. So it is your job as a CEO. You can't relegate that to somebody else. You can't have a chief strategy officer that thinks for you. You have to think as a CEO. So that's, that's important. I would say if you don't sell anything, you don't have a company. If you don't have a company, who cares what your strategy is? But, <laughs> but once you have a company and you've got some stuff going, then you need to think about other things. That's when you hire that sales VP to come in, and by that time, you'll that know you what can. a real sales VP looks like, and you'll hire the right person, so therefore you can elevate yourself to go off and do other things. But and then you can focus fair. on the vision aspect. And you no, can that's focus really good. on the vision aspect. Jonathan, did you have, we have one more, and then we're going to wrap up the questions. If, feel free to stick around and talk to Les afterward. Yes. What is your approach to creating alignment? So we've just taken over as the CEO? Just taken over as the CEO, the successor? For I'm a successor to a founder is what yeah, you're saying. Coming, yep. coming in into a new team, you see some people who are already established. Yeah. How so, do you establish the, the alignment for the team? Is that really? Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I just that. for the repeating for the video here. Yeah. So um, I can tell you that I've done it wrong several times. And I've done it writer a few times, probably not ever <laughs> right. Um, what I do, what I've learned to do, I should say, so what I've learned over the lessons of doing it wrong for enough times, is I've learned to engage the executive team and to tell them what I stand for, literally what my DNA is. I did get thrown out of one company because I told them what my DNA was and they didn't like it. I told them that I hated the Yankees. And they, happened, <laughs> they happened to be Yankees fans and, and I never got past that, literally never got past that. So. But I tell the truth. I'm not a Yankees fan. In any case, the, um, the way I go about it is I say, this is who I am. And you can be who you are with me. That's fine. Let's figure out what your role and responsibilities should be in the company. And if those roles and responsibilities align with our needs as a company, then you will have a career here, at least for now. If they don't, then I'm going to treat you as fairly as I can and there may not be a role here for you. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it to start out with. I'm going to tell you what I think to start out with. Now, a lot of people, a lot of teams don't like that, but I got to tell you that in the long run, that's the best thing you could possibly say. Because if you say something else that's not authentic and say, like many people do, you're doing a great job. You know, the fact that you missed your sales numbers for the last five years doesn't matter. I really like you. Um, that, that perpetuates a thought process that I'm either stupid or blind or willing to put up with mediocrity. And, and so it's important to me in a company to ensure that people know that I, that I mean business. I don't mean that from an abrupt negative point of view. I also let my hair down. I used to have longer hair. I let my hair down a lot. So I tell people who I am with my foibles and all. So I always do, and when, again, I tell them I'm not a Yankees fan because it's true, but I always tell them something about me that makes them chuckle. So I have, I have several stories about that. My, my one story that always gets a chuckle, this group may, well, some people may be old enough to, to know this <laughs> one. But um, when I went to high school, I had very long hair. I had very long hair. It was down to my shoulders. Actually, I met my wife when we were in high school, and my hair was longer than hers. Okay, it's not today, but, but it was. But that's not the, the real story. The real story is I went to school with this guy who was a great musician. He really was a great musician. And he was a long-haired guy. His hair wasn't quite as long as mine. Um, and he became famous. And he today is known as Twisted Sister. So I went to high school in my class, my year, with Twisted Sister, and my hair was longer than his. <laughs> People look at me and go, holy crap. Either you're that old, or you had hair that long, or, or you might have actually associated with somebody that nutty. 
Um, you know, he's been very successful, D. Snyder. He's a, he's a good yeah. guy. Um, he's really figured out how to take a career with makeup on and turn it into like real life stuff. Um, but uh, he was a great musician when we were in high school, and who would have thunk it? I mean, he was just a he was a timid, quiet, really nice guy, and he turned into Twisted Sister. So that's pretty cool. People look at me and go, "Wow, you might actually be human." <laughs> <laughs> that's the beginning. That's the beginning. And then I do things with them like. I'll play golf with them, and then they'll really know I'm human, because I suck at golf. And do things like that, and, and we do that kind of stuff. And so they can see me, you know, in the real life that I'm not, you know, I, I joke about it a lot, but I say to them, you know, yesterday I wasn't the CEO. Today I am. I'm not any smarter today. So you just need to understand that. And so trying to be honest, authentic, real life, human, a lot of CEOs don't like to be human. I, I am who I am, and that's what I try to do. And then I try to have the team coalesce around it. It's very hard, though, when you have non-performers on the team, which almost always, by definition, when a founder is leaving, founders don't leave companies because it's fun to leave a company. They leave companies because they have to. And it's usually well overdue by the time they leave. If they leave voluntarily, it's because they're completely fed up and if they leave because somebody's taking them out like they're venture capitalists or they're bored, it's because it's really time. Because venture capitalists love founders <laughs> as CEOs. They do. They would love to have the founder be the CEO forever. And you're seeing it today in some of these public companies. Even with some of the stuff going on with these companies, the founder's still there, even though you kind of like scratch your head and go, Why? Really? Yeah. Because the, the, the financing community, and this is now public companies, the public companies don't want to upset the apple cart. So they'd really rather have the founder there. If the founder's not there, it's because there's a problem. And if there's a problem, it likely ends up somewhere pointing at people. And not people that are bad, but people that might be the wrong people for what's needed to be done now. So you're likely going to have to take out, make them available for industry. Some people, that will not make you very well loved. Because there are other people on the team will go, uh oh, what's going to happen to me now? Mm. And so you do get their backs up a little bit, but you gotta, you got to get under their skin. you got to have them understand what they're good at. You have to help them to understand what their role is and have them self-select as to whether it's the right place for them as well. And It's hard, though. There's no magic. We talked about it earlier. There's no magic in this HR culture thing. It's really, really hard, and it's got lots of moving pieces. I think that's a lot of really good stuff, and I'm still struggling with how I could have gotten through more of that book because there's still so much more to talk about. Thank you so much, Les, for My pleasure. all of that information. And I hope everybody was able to enjoy that. So thank you, Les.